Okay, so we heard what the banks are about, and we're now going to hear about the, in the equity and investment community. In our survey, which I mentioned earlier on, Standard Chartered and Marine Money, 59% um, of those who responded actually said that equity and capital markets are an attractive source of capital. So there's certainly a lot of interest in it. We have a large panel here, as you can see, our uh, moderator, Susan Ritala, who's a partner at uh, Reed Smith. Uh, Susan, please. Hi, thank you. Um, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the panel, and thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, we have got a big panel here today, so um, we'll, um, we'll dive straight in, make sure we don't go over, over Kevin's timetable. Um, and obviously, so the, the topic today is what are shipping investors looking to see in 2024? And we've talked over the last couple of years a lot about various macroeconomic um, events that have impacted shipping. Um, seems we're still sailing in some rather choppy waters, pun intended. So um, let's get started. Um, let's start with a general question. Um, what makes an attractive shipping investment in 2024? Nicholas, do you want to perhaps start? With yeah, thank you very much. I, I don't think uh, that uh, what makes an attractive investment in shipping has changed through the years. It's still, you know, more or less uh, the markets, the underlying fundamentals of markets, how they look, the availability of capital, and, uh, you know, the general sentiment. Of course, in the past five years, it looks and it feels like we didn't have three months without some crazy event happening, from coronavirus to wars uh, these uh, last few uh, years. Uh, so I think what this has resulted in, this disruption, has resulted in bringing shipping back uh, to, the, to the mainstream as a, as a possible investment. Uh, in, in, in my view, what uh, today is interesting, let's say, of course, the, the, the equity capital markets do look interesting, the public markets look interesting, is where even you see uh, seasoned shipping investors getting back to. We've seen a few uh, ship owners actually buying companies or buying stakes in companies. Uh, of course, the debt side is something that's uh, very interesting, especially the alternative uh, debt. And in terms of geographies, we've, saw, we've seen in the past new geographies coming in, especially the Middle East, which is also an area we, uh, we spend a lot of time in. Uh, the Middle East is more of an offshore uh, investment, uh, let's say, target. That's the, the main uh, product of, of the area. And uh, it's probably one of the best, uh, uh, best places to invest in, given the fundamentals and... Uh, uh, the, the lack of availability of capital in the region. So that, I think that would summarize. Thank you. Alexis, let me come to, you, come to you next. I suppose the same question. And obviously you're one of the guys with the money. So are there uh, any particular sectors and geographies that are particularly interesting to you now that maybe weren't previously and how your kind of strategies evolved? Sure. I was going to build on what Nicola said. Um, shipping is very volatile. It's very capital intensive is not for everyone, is less transparent. Um, I mean, COVID, Ukraine, Panama Canal, Red Sea, price shock, OPEC, I mean, in all in three, four years. So there's plenty of um, volatility, uh, which makes shipping interesting. Um, at the same time, where we are in the cycle uh, is, is a lot more difficult than a few years ago. Uh, having said that, fundamentals are as good as they've ever been. Uh, the oil book is very low. Um, bearing a recession, uh, demand is quite resilient. Um, so there are pa th there are parts of the of the industry which actually look quite attractive. Um, what we try to do, given who we are, is find things which are not just uh, a bet on the market. So they are more esoteric, private transactions, more structured, so that you are of course having a view on the outlook of a certain sector. Uh, but you try to build some more downside protection. You try to uh, have some employment, for example. That's the obvious way um, uh, kind of to create a, something which is more kind of appropriate for uh, institutional capital. Um, we are a ship owner uh, by owning ships, but at the same time, we are not a traditional sh private ship owner or public company. So we need a, a, a type of investment that actually fits our, our capital. Thank you. Um, Howell, same question to you. Thank you very much. And um, I would then rather share some of the experiences that we have made over the last seven years. And that's uh, the seven years that we have existed as a bank and has 
dispersed about $1 billion in loans and financed 180 vessels in the second-hand market. And all of these investments live their own lives, so to say. So we, we can only share of the experiences that we have made because we are not investors, we are lenders, but uh, at the same time, it's reciprocal considerations actually between our clients and ourselves. We feel we're more uh, uh, as a partner with our uh, investment uh, clients and our, our, our borrowers. But, but in this, uh, this, this atmosphere, you know, I would uh, like to say that the ability uh, in the management of, of the ships, you know, to handle and deal with unexpected events is, is a really an important factor. We have been through the pandemic situation, we have been through a war situation, we have recently uh, a lot of disruptions in the market caused by, by, by wars and, and geopolitical unrest. And uh, the, the experience and the uh, knowledge to deal with this type of situations are, are decisive in our eyes when it comes to selections of new, new projects. One thing, of course, that you have to go for asset types that you have knowledge about and can, and, and can manage in a, in a proper fashion. But at the same time, the, the, the human capital on the management side is from time to time a little bit underestimated, uh, seen with our eyes. And uh, that you don't lose your head if something unexpected happens. Thank you. Jake, do you want to weigh in? Sure. So we're partial to chemicals, uh, particularly stainless. Uh, we still think that there's a lot of opportunity there. And it all has to do with supply side. Um, this past summer, we started seeing prices get pretty, pretty toppy, and I thought nah, this is probably not. We're probably done buying, and then went out to the, a lot of the yards and started to see that there's there really is no capacity to keep up with the age of the fleet, and so we ended up deciding that you know new tonnage now is much better than tonnage coming out out of the order book given where where rates are at, and so we decided let's pay the second second hand rates uh, and put those vessels to work and really. For us, it's, and I think for all investors now getting into shipping, it's, it's all about cash flow. Get that cash flow, be dividend yielding immediately, de-risk the investment, get the principal back to shareholders uh, so that you, you, because it is a, a, a volatile sector, you have no idea two or three years down the road, you know, when's this thing gonna come off? We don't know. But we do have about 12 month visibility. We do understand where the supply side is. I don't really focus on demand because the market's gonna do what it's gonna, going to do. Demand's gonna go up and down. There's nothing I can do more about that. But if I can dividend out cash flow to, to investors and reduce that risk immediately, it makes the investment much more attainable. Thank you. And I don't want to leave you out, Willem. Do you want to mention anything about your thoughts for future 2024? I think, <coughs> I think what makes an attractive investment in 2024 is probably the same features that made an attractive investment in 2015. I think you... You need to be able to, uh, the future earnings plus your residual value need to be larger than what you pay for the ship, uh, basically. And uh, obviously today you pay more, but you have uh, higher cash flows. And uh, in, in terms of segment wise, I'm, uh, we, we don't have a strategy where we buy ships uh, from a thesis that we believe we know where the market is going. We are true believers of diversification because we are painfully aware that we don't know where the market is going. Uh, so you can you can have the simple view, okay, the order book looks fine in most segments and and the world is moving on. I think last year was the first time we surpassed 12 billion tons of cargo being seaborne. I think it's important to, to, import, uh, to remember that 8 billion of those two-thirds were discharged in developing economies. Uh, only four of them were in developed economies. So it's growth in shipping demand is not coming from the people in this room uh, in London. It's coming from completely different parts of the world uh, where they may have different criteria of how the future is going to look like than, than we have. Thank you. Um, I will just slightly change tack. Um, we've obviously, even in the last couple of sessions, um, heard a bit, quite a bit about the uh, good old um, green shipping and uh, about um, IMO targets and related adjustments that ship owners might need to make. So um, the next question, um, Mohammed, let me ask you, how much is that a consideration for you in, in making decisions about what you're doing? Um, yeah, well, the UAE and, and Abu Dhabi National Oil Company in, in, in general, 
um, have been quite leading the race when it comes to uh, decarbonization efforts. And um, ADNOC has been looking for, for every opportunity to transform, to decarbonize, and to future-proof uh, like the, uh, the operations across the value chain from the well to, to the customer. Um, even though we, we are the, one of the lowest uh, carbon-intensive uh, producer uh, globally, um, we, the targets that we have set amongst ADNOC are actually much tighter than the ones that we have seen in IMO. We have um, a um, net zero by 2045 instead of 2050. We are reducing 25% uh, of, uh, of carbon uh, like by, by 2030. Um, last week, there has been uh, a 23 billion um, a, uh, program for uh, landmark decarbonization projects and technology for low carbon that has been announced by the board of ADNOC. And from a uh, carbon capture and storage, we have doubled the capacity to 10 million uh, tons per annum, which is equivalent to reducing almost 2 million cars from, from the highways today. Now, if, if we look at, at, the, um, at what LNS is doing, LNS is com has committed to, uh, to invest. LNS is the logistics and services arm of ADNOC. Um, we have committed to invest two billion in uh, in uh, uh, efficient, uh, like envir environmentally efficient uh, fleet. We have also committed to reduce by forty percent the the reduction if we compare it by to to twenty twenty. Um, now, if if we look at the strategy that we're taking towards decarbonization in LNS, uh, I would summarize it in in three different uh, brackets. One would be uh, technology and. Uh, and uh, digitalization. The second one would be um, the alternative fuels and, and research and development. And the third is, and last but not least, but the financing effort or the financing options and the engagement with, uh, with the investors. On the technological front, uh, what we have done is um, like focus on AI. We've been spearheading the AI, uh, the AI uh, race and uh, some examples of technology is uh, what we call smart chip. So it's an AI-based predictive maintenance solution that allows for better planning, that allows for uh, operational efficiency. Um, it also allows uh, for uh, improving the performance of the ships. We have also installed up to uh, 80 or uh, sorry, equipped 80 of our vessels with what we call um, smart vessel. This is also an AI-based solution that is destined for HSC, so health and safety. Um, we, we use analytics, uh, we use real-time analytics to drive performance. And uh, we have also like, a, this is more linked to the ETS uh, scheme, but also this is something that is for decarbonization and monitoring of emissions that, has, that, is quite, uh, that, is, uh, that has been introduced lately. Um, the second point that I've mentioned is regarding the alternative fuels. So we have invested in uh, four VLCCs, dual fuel LNG. Well, we've been speaking about them in the panels earlier. We're continuing our investment. So the majority of our future fleet of our new builds are, are towards that particular, um, that particular um, uh, technology. Uh, we're also partnering up with, with universities, leading universities on that front. And part of, of the, uh, the, the program for investment is actually towards research and development on that field. The last point is with regards to financing options. I think that this is a problem or this is a, something that has to be uh, led uh, generally like in, in, in as a consortium with all the shipping industry in general. And we should be, uh, as financiers within the shipping, uh, look or start to investigate into different like financial mechanisms, maybe uh, subsidies, maybe incentives, uh, work and partner up with, with, different, um, with different organizations, maybe governmental organizations, at least in the GCC or elsewhere in the world, with research institutions to, uh, to drive um, a collective effort towards uh, sustainability in, in, in shipping. And of course, having a transparent communication with our investors with regards to all the efforts that we're doing in ESG is key. And this has, has, uh, has been quite a, a smooth ride with, with discussions with our bankers. Thank you. Um, so I guess that from the other side of the coin, then from the investor's point of view, how important is that? Is the ESG piece for you? Is uh, you know investing in new technologies and things like that? Lex, if you're looking at me, so I will, uh, I will let you answer it's that. It's a quite a tough question. I think it was touched on many times uh, today. I think it's quite difficult 
Um, I think, first of all, we apply ESG uh, to everything we do, not just in shipping. Uh, it's a very practical, not a values-based ESG approach, because at the end of the day, all these factors affect the risk profile of our investment. It's not just the objective of the decarbonization, it's actually the risk um, of our portfolio companies um, as it affects their, their, their operations. From an investor perspective today, I think it was discussed in the previous panel as well, given the uncertainty on the technology, given the uncertainty on the availability of the alternative fuels, given the uncertainty on the cost of this technology and how it's going to evolve, and the impact it has on residual values, it's very hard to do a speculative investment with new technology. Uh, if you have an employment contract that actually pays for that technology, it makes it uh, easier. So that's why the whole, the whole industry effort has to be more coordinated uh, and there has to be more clarity, uh, both on the timeline as well as the path to what I think is accepted by everyone, that the industry has to evolve and has to improve. So uh, unfortunately, there is capital, um, but certain parameters have to be met uh, for that to be channeled into it. But, and we have done investments in, in new technology, um, but they came with um, certain, let's say, uh, protections that allowed us to, to take that risk. Thank you. Helvo. I, I follow 100% of what you're saying there and, and commenting. We feel from time to time there is a, a quite huge discrepancy between the ambitions from politicians and the regulators. And, and what's going on in the maritime industry. And, and uh, please don't misunderstand me. There is huge willingness to invest in new technology from, from, uh, from the maritime uh, environment and from the maritime society, but for the right reasons. There has to be a foundation which is commercial. Uh, it has to be self-sustained projects that live on its own, uh, so to say, profitability and not of governmental subsidies. So this will take time, and we foresee that there will be many processes going forward in parallel. There is none, I, th I think we can forget about finding one universal solution for the propulsions, for the alternative fuels and so on. There will obviously be uh, 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 a specter of different technologies uh, bringing the maritime sector into the goals that has been uh, been the writing on the wall 2030 and 2050, but this will will happen in stages. And, and for me, being a technology optimist, <laughs> I foresee also that we haven't seen yet what can come of new inventions and so on. And the, the latest uh, uh, panel before us, they, they touched upon the life extension studies, which I think is a very, very important part of, of bringing the maritime industry into compliance, because uh, it was also pointed at the, the carbon footprint of new buildings versus investing in existing tonnage and, and finding uh, good solutions and, and improved uh, solutions. So I think that must come even more into the scope. Thank you. Um, Jake, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, maybe I'm, I'm just going to be blunt. Um, in my opinion, ESG is not an investment thesis. It's a cost discussion. And it's a cost discussion around, do you want to be good corporate citizens? Uh, the IMO and the fuel discussion to me, uh, what I've seen is a lot of idealism and not a lot of real practical commercial solutions. I don't think we're going to have a silver bullet to the fuel discussion over the next, between now and 2030. Where I do think our industry can get better, and we should, is around the efficiencies of these vessels. You can make these ships more fuel efficient. And so as you put each ship through your special survey in dry dock, I would highly recommend all of you, and we've done this on, on our ships, and I'm, we've got 22 vessels going through dry dock. Um, you should be investing in cost-saving measures, energy-saving devices. We've put them on our vessels. Um, usually you can make the investment back within a year or so. Um, and that's really where I think we, as an industry, can be much better corporate citizens than trying to find us. There is no catch-all here that we're all going to solve this this, this problem with uh, some future fuel. And so I do think we can be much better by just investing in our ships and making them a little bit more fuel efficient because you, you'll probably find you'll save seven to 10% on your fuel by investing in these. And these can be done in dry dock. They're not gonna slow your vessel. You're gonna come out on time and you'll be back making money. Thank you.
you want to comment, like, agree or not agree? <laughs> no, no, I agree. I think that was, but we, I think we only covered the E part of the ESG, and I think the ESG is a, is a lot more than that. And I think um, there's, there, there might be dilemmas coming up between, between the S and the, and the E. Um, going back to my point that two-thirds of all shipping is discharged in places in the world where maybe um, energy security and uh, life standard of people, at least in the short run, is going to have a higher priority for them than, than the E. So secondly, then it's, it's even more important that we, uh, people in the West who have been through the last 30 years of our evolution, can, can spend the money because we can afford it on, on the E and then make sure that the S in the de developing world is taken care of because then they can move on to the E later on. Yes, thank you. So um, I suppose ESG aside more generally, um, what are some of the things that, you know, d d well, in 2024 in the, uh, in, in the, I suppose we still say uncertain market, um, ship owners should be doing or are doing that would put them in the best possible position to uh, get the investment when they need it. And we heard earlier that the general opinion was that there's low def deal flow, but to the extent that someone is in need of investment, what, what should they be doing? Um, Nicholas, what are you seeing in, in your um, various deals? I think it's, um, you know, for most markets and how you plan to the for the future has to do with where you also stand today in the sense that we've had a good run in most of the markets in the past three years. A lot of the owners have uh, cash and uh, there is no pressure really to make investments in shipping per se. It, it's a really good time to go, you know, meet targets on the G side of ESG on governance and that's something that can also help uh, in the future uh, with, uh, with relationships with your uh, financiers and investors. So it's, I think for most of, uh, of, of, of the players in, in, in these main markets, uh, investing in relationships right now when you don't really need to have, let's say, financing in most cases, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. I think the winners of the next 10 years will be companies that have uh, very good uh, reporting uh, systems, both on the financial side and the operational side, and the operational side is getting more important uh, as time goes by because of all uh, what we discussed today, and people that have access to capital throughout the cycle. Ten years ago, we've been in this, uh, in this same conference, we were discussing where does the money come from, and there was really no answer to that. Now we have the other problem, we don't have an answer to where is the money going to, because there is so much money in the, in the industry right now. So I think uh, what ship owners should be doing in general is in investing in their internal processes, and also investing in not new technologies per se, but more efficient technologies in the sense of new ships that are more economical, retrofits uh, to the extent uh, possible. In general, I, I find it a bit, let's say, cynical to discuss how we will make more uh, environmentally friendly a coal carrier or an oil carrier. So there must be answers outside of just ordering new ships that uh, bear less. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Havel, your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's uh, no, I, I agree with you, Nicholas. It's uh, it's not a matter of only new buildings as uh, such. It's uh, being creative and trying to and, and trying to adapt because I think that's the key word. And the shipping industry is actually masters of of, of adapt to different changing uh, parameters and their new regulations. Just look at what has happened on the emission side over the last few years. And before that, we had the fuel uh, uh, transmission from, uh, from high sulfur to low sulfur and so on. And then the, uh, the, the world trade is, is, is going on and the seaborne transportation is increasing uh, basically year by year, even though it's, uh, it's challenging around the corner. So I hope that uh, 2024 will be a, a new active year for the shipping sector. It seems at least uh, the supply of credit on the, on the lending side is massive. And this also seems to be uh, enough uh, risk-willing uh, capital on the on the equity side. So uh, it's really up to us to try to uh, create some good opportunities. Maybe just to add something, just uh, stepping away from just the decarbonization and uh, the new technologies. Uh, we've done multiple partnerships with ship owners over the last 15 years. There are certain ingredients that are quite important for a successful, healthy partnership and that's alignment of interest, the same culture, the same investment approach, which all have to be discussed and agreed up front. I think the other thing which has changed and we touched on it before, COVID, uh, 
Panama Canal, Ukraine, etc., is that the shipping cycles have become a lot shorter. So portfolio management, risk management became even more important. You cannot, this, I buy a ship for 25 years and I sit on it. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's even less uh, maybe relevant or the right approach, depending of course on the capital behind it. Um, and so the active portfolio management um, between the ship owner and its investors, I think is, is, is quite important. Whether it's buying and selling, whether it's employment contracts, whether it's de-risking, whether it's taking cash when, you, when it's there, I fully agree with Jake, um, and reducing your residual risk, whether it's re renewing your fleet, whether it's new technologies, you have to be super active uh, in, in managing your investments. Thank you. Thank you. And I suppose it, you know, touching on something there that you've said shipping cycles are becoming shorter, and obviously we probably talked about this many times before, is that you know big global events like you know the war in Ukraine and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, COVID, all these things actually can be good for shipping. Um, so I suppose in terms of what we have going on in the news at the moment, uh, in terms of all the issues in the Red Sea and Israeli and Palestine war, how are we seeing that as developing? what you're doing. I'm going to open up to the panel for, I think, Jake, you want to say something? I think about. it's fantastic. <laughs> the Houthis are a bad shot. We all make more money. Um, no, in all seriousness, the w every ship owner here should just start going around. Um, the only way that this stops is the Egyptians feel the financial pain and they call Iran and say, stop this mess. Um, the United States can drop all the bombs in the world they want. They've been doing that for 20 years in Afghanistan and gotten nowhere. So I don't really see a solution here other than the Egyptians getting involved and saying, hey, the gravy train has stopped. Fix this. Thank you. Alan? Yeah, no, I, think it's, I think it's a proof uh, that you know, disruption is, is real in shipping. Uh, disruptive events happen all the time and it has an effect on the market and usually uh, in a positive way if you're a ship owner. Um, but you can't really... You can't really calculate. Uh, th these are not events that you can put into your Excel sheet, right? So it's it's investing in shipping. Is uh, I would say it's about two things. It's uh, like Alexis said. It's it's in real estate they say location, location, location. In shipping I say alignment, alignment, alignment. You need to make sure that you and whoever is operating the ship are 100% aligned. Uh, and other than that, you just need to buy something for a terrible market. Um, make sure that you're able to, to maneuver down the, the down cycles because everybody can handle the upside. And believe me, upsides will come. It's going to be more volatile probably in the next 10 years than the last 10, but it's going to be between the first and the fourth floor and not between the basement and the first floor. Thank you. Paolo, you were going to say it's, something? It's always a great uh, paradox that we are touching about that all these dis disruptions and geopolitical unrest is creating uh, good opportunities for international shipping. That's nothing new that we have seen for decades and even for s the whole centuries. So, and it's always innocent people that hurts, that are being uh, damaged. Uh, that's uh, terrible. I haven't got any illusions uh, left, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, conflict solution in 2024 is to uh, launch uh, rockets into civilian areas. Uh, sorry to say, but uh, to gather people around the table and try to find solutions is, seems to be impossible because it's directed by uh, a lot of other considerations that I cannot uh, understand. But uh, uh, when that is said, you know, I, I think that uh, the world is demanding uh, safe uh, transportation of critical supplies, and uh, that concerns uh, international shipping uh, in a broader context. And my thoughts goes to the, all the seamen, the seafarers, sailing personnel that are risking their lives so that we should have a, a, a safe supply of, of critical commodities. That, that's in, in a nutshell what this concerns. Thank you. And for any American football fans out there, I think we need like, the two-minute warning. So I will let you uh, provide any final thoughts from the panel, seeing as there's quite a few of you, um, before we wrap up. If anyone has any. <laughs> any Q&A? No? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> I guess we'll wrap, wrap it up there then, Kevin. Get, I think we'll take you back into schedule. So <laughs> thank you very much for the panel. Thanks. <laughs>